Welcome back, everybody. It's been four months since I did my last review of the Verizon 5G home internet service, and I want to give you an update in this video. I'm going to tell you about the things that went well and some of the things that have been somewhat annoying. First, I want to say that the quality of service has been terrific. In the four months that I've been using Verizon 5G home internet, I haven't had a single outage. When I was on the AT&T DSL, there were periods of time when the internet would go down for like 10, 15 minutes at a time. It would happen occasionally every few weeks or every month or so, and usually very late at nighttime. But it would be annoyance when I can't use my internet. So far, I haven't had such an outage when I'm using the Verizon internet service. So as far as uptime goes, things have been good. One of the major concerns I addressed in my last video was about the electromagnetic radiation, also known as EMF. I had the Verizon communications equipment, which is the router for the home network, and as well as the component that communicates with the cell phone towers, I had that sitting in a desk on my office. That location made me a little bit uncomfortable because if I'm really worried about any sort of health hazard that could arise from exposure to that type of radiation, having it sitting on that desk where someone could be working at a computer, myself or a family member, just didn't sit well with me. Using my EMF meter, the amount of RF radiation that a person was exposed to sitting at that desk was between 20 and sometimes up to 200 times the amount of normal background electromagnetic radiation. So to minimize that exposure, I moved my router box from the office to that ledge right up there. Moving the box out of this office seemed to bring the EMF levels in here back to normal levels, but there were a few costs involved in that. First, I had to buy some Wi-Fi adapters for the desktop computers in here. Previously, I was using Ethernet cables that I directly plugged into the Verizon routing box. The Wi-Fi desktop adapter that I got initially, I found out actually had really lousy performance. This was limiting me to a speed of 100 megabits per second. Also, upon doing some further research, I found some information about these wavelength routers that they might contain some Chinese spyware in them, and that was a little bit of a cause for concern. So I switched to a Netgear router, which I'm using on my main computer right now. I also had to get two routers because I have one main desktop in here and I have a server which I actually put together in another episode. Now let's total up these costs and we'll see what the true cost was of switching from AT&T DSL to Verizon. So the first piece of equipment I bought, which was a dud, was the Wavelink Wi-Fi adapter. And I consider that to be a sunk cost. I have my Netgear Nighthawk Wi-Fi router and that one's been working pretty well, however it cost me $76. I also had to get a special Wi-Fi adapter for the Linux server that I'm running. That one cost me $42. And finally, I wanted to have a backup power supply in the area where I put the Verizon 5G router because if the power goes out, I still want to be able to have the internet. And that cost me $101. Totaling that up, it cost me $257 to buy all this additional equipment. I'm saving $13 a month on the Verizon service versus what I was paying AT&T. So at that rate, it's going to take about 20 months to fully recover the cost of the additional equipment. But I guess the benefit is that I'm getting much better speeds than I did on the AT&T DSL. Now, one of the things about this deal that did kind of offset that was that Verizon offered me a $200 gift card when I signed up with the Verizon 5G internet service. And it took like three months to get that and they sent it to me in an email. However, using it was somewhat difficult. I was only able to use that card on things that I could buy in the Verizon store. I couldn't apply it to my bill. So I had to buy some piece of hardware from Verizon. Ultimately, I decided to upgrade my phone because the battery on my previous Galaxy S9 was dying, so I upgraded to an S23. If I wasn't forced to buy something from the Verizon store, I probably would have gotten my S23 from somewhere else and probably at a cheaper price. But then when I was trying to buy this through the Verizon website, I had difficulty getting this thing to work with their system. It didn't quite recognize it and apply the discount. So I had to call up the technical support and it took me an hour or two to get this all sorted out and some emails back and forth. 
it was a mess. So now let's talk about whether there was a performance hit to my internet speed from moving the router off of the ethernet cables as it's directly connected to over to the other room where it's now connecting by Wi-Fi. To test the quality of my internet connection, I wrote a Ruby script which I'm running on my Linux server. Every four hours, it uses the speedtest.net API to check what the download and upload speeds are. You can see the script on my GitHub, which I posted a link to in the description. Now let's take a look at these results. I created this histogram, which kind of groups the internet speeds I was getting with each test. I had a batch of tests from before I moved the internet router when it was running on ethernet, and I had a batch of tests I ran after I moved the router, which was purely on Wi-Fi. And as you could see, it seems like there was probably a little bit of a performance hit when it's on the Wi-Fi, but it's not by much. And by the way, this is all using the speedtest.net API, so it's testing what the performance is to hit an outside site on the internet, outside of my network. Here's the histogram for the upload speed batches. When we had the computer directly connected to the Verizon box via the ethernet cable, it seemed like we were getting more consistent results in upload speed. So if you notice, this histogram has a very long tail, meaning that there were many times when the upload speed seemed to drop below the normal range of about 20 to 25 megabits per second. If we look at the statistics, we could see that the mean and median download speeds have been pulled down a little bit, but there's a very long tail which causes the standard deviation to increase when you're looking at Wi-Fi. I'm not exactly sure what would explain this and why we didn't see a similar result in the download speed. The best I could come up with is that it's some type of a hardware issue, maybe either with the Wi-Fi adapter or with the Verizon routing box. Now, one thing where we did get a performance degradation was with the ping times. So if you notice when this computer was connected directly to the ethernet cable, we had a clustering of our ping times down in the low 20 milliseconds. However, after switching to the Wi-Fi, that adds a little bit of latency to the network traffic and our ping times are now a lot higher. We see that the mean has moved from 28 to 33, but you could kind of visually see this here on the chart. To the right is actually a worse ping time and worse performance than it is to the left. And then the blue is on Wi-Fi, the red is when it's connected through the ethernet cable. As you can see, the distribution shifted over to the right. This might actually make a difference to you if you're a gamer. And finally, one area of performance where I did notice a significant drop was when I'm transferring large files, like these video files I'm working on, from my main computer onto my server, which I use to store the files for backup when I'm done editing these videos. When both computers were connected to the ethernet cable, it was really fast and it would only take a few seconds to move gigabyte big files. However, now that all this is done over Wi-Fi, transferring the multi-gigabyte files of videos is a lot slower. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about, and this is the biggest annoyance I've had so far with the service, is that my IP address frequently changes. If the Verizon routing box, for whatever reason, loses power, my IP address is gonna change when it reconnects. And that's one of the reasons I need to get that uninterruptible power supply. However, even when it's fed continuous power, at times I notice, probably about once every two weeks on average, my IP address will spontaneously change. Now, for most people, this isn't going to matter. But for me, I'm a software developer, and I frequently connect to certain servers that have my IP address whitelisted for security reasons. Every once in a while I was having difficulty connecting to a server that I thought I was whitelisted on. And then I check my IP address, I'd find out that I have a different one now, and I have to go into the AWS or Azure control panels and enter the new IP address to update my home network settings. And that was kind of an annoyance. I was able to somewhat mitigate this by using a subnet mask to cover the range of IP addresses that seems that my IP could switch to. However, that's quite a bit less secure than just having one single whitelisted IP address at a time. Let's summarize what we've got here and what I've noticed after using this service for a little bit over four months. Let's address some of the concerns I talked about in my previous video. First of all, the quality of service is really good. I'm getting great internet speeds. They're fairly consistent and I'm overall happy with the quality and continuity of the service. 
For a while, I did have some concerns about the amount of EMF radiation that that Verizon routing box is putting off, but I think I've been able to successfully mitigate that by moving the box away from any area where humans would typically be at. When you back away from that device, the amount of EMF that you're exposed to exponentially decreases. So moving it above that door in my living room seems to be a pretty safe location. I'm not detecting meaningful levels of EMF anywhere else. So I think I've been able to address that concern pretty well. As far as costs, if you're gonna switch your ISP, one thing that you probably wanna consider is whatever additional hardware you might wanna buy for your new setup. As we mentioned, I had to buy some additional Wi-Fi adapters and power supplies. By far the biggest annoyance that I have in using this is my constantly changing IP address. I would like to have a consistent IP address and have it remain that way for some time so that it doesn't affect some of the servers I'm connecting to, but like I said, I was able to use a subnet mask to kind of fix this. However, it's not an ideal situation. And then the final thing that I've been unable to address with this service is the redundancy aspect. So now all of my internet through my phone and my home internet is done through Verizon. What worries me is there might be a time when I need to use the internet such as if I'm trading stock or something like that, or let's say I have a critical issue with my work, it would be very costly for me if the internet went down and became completely inaccessible and I have no backup. If the Verizon network goes down for whatever reason, I'm screwed. And we saw this happen a few months ago with AT&T. Nationwide, customers were affected by a software glitch that caused their internet service on their phones and their home internet to go down completely for several hours. So for me, the redundancy aspect is the thing that I'm most concerned about with this service. Anyway, I hope you found this video to be a helpful review. If you liked it, hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. See you in the next video.